beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving a light to those who long have gone, and guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us till the glory dawn. Oh, give us thy light to light. To the land of perfect day, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of life, guiding the pilgrim through the night, over the mountain tail, the break. thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day beautiful star of bethlehem shine on oh beautiful star the hope of rest for the redeemed the good and blessed yonder in glory win the crown
Thank you for that. Let's go to the key of F. After this song, Brother Jim, if you'd come for your special. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful.
hands were nail-scarred. His side was riven. He gave his life's blood for even me. Death's chilly waters I may soon be crossing His hand will lead me safe or think of this I'll join the chorus city and sing up there for ever more oh what a savior oh hallelujah his heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nail scarred. His side was riven. He gave his life's sing with us. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nailed just stand this morning down from his glory ever living story my God and Savior came and Jesus was his own us
bless you all this morning. I want to say God bless you and I wish you a Merry Christmas. Pray that the Lord of our lives will fill our heart. Amen. As we remember what he's done for us. Let's bow our heads together as we pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful God, that you've gathered us together again today. And God, I'm so excited, Lord, to be on this earth serving you in this time. It's a dark age, Lord, full of wickedness. But oh, you have brought such a light, Lord. God, just as you birthed yourself into flesh 2,000 years ago, Lord, you came to shine the light, Lord, to reflect the life of God and the Son. God, I pray that you would do the same thing now in us as your sons and daughters. Would you be born in our hearts, Lord, to reflect your life in us? For we yield ourselves to you. As we look into your word, Lord, I pray, God, that you would come yourself and break the bread of life. For no man can do it, Lord. We're looking to you, Lord. We're not sufficient, but you are all sufficient, Lord. We're trusting in you to come down, Lord, and take this word and break it, Lord, to us and deliver it to us and feed us by your own hand, Lord, that we might have, Lord, the nourishment we need for the journey that we're in. 
Father, we love you. May we glorify your name. May we remember you. May we shout your praises and testify of your goodness and proclaim your truth, Lord, wherever we go. May we shine the light of the hour, Lord, in these vessels of clay. May they contain, Lord, a treasure, a treasure of your word, Lord, of your very life manifesting itself. May, may that be a bright light that shines in a dark place in this end time. We love you. We thank you for all you've revealed to us, all you're doing, and all that we can enjoy in this hour and in this season. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. While we're standing, let's take a look at St. Luke. I just want to say I very much appreciated the specials. That was quite a blessing. Thank you all for doing that. Amen. It's, it's so wonderful to share that gift with us. Amen. Also, I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas and also want to thank you all. We have been, we have been overwhelmed by love, by cards, by text, by gifts, by your picture cards, by uh, cookies and candies. And Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Amen. I love, I love going to the piano and picking up all the cards and reading all the messages in them and looking on the wall at all the picture cards. I just want to say God bless you and thank you for your expression of love to our family. And we want to say we love you too. And pray that you have a wonderful Christmas with your families. And may God, amen, shine his light through each one of you. I'm so happy to be gathered here together today. And we want to welcome all the visitors. God bless you that join, all that were able to join in. And we just want to say we love you all. Amen. While we're standing, let's look at Luke chapter 2. And we're going to go for Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen. God bless you as you have your seats. Amen. God is good. Before I break into this, keep your place in the scripture. We're going to read through this. But I just want to let you know that uh, this coming week, my family and I are going to get away for a couple days. We had a little window of opportunity where David was off school. The girls had a few days off, so we're jumping on, and we're going to spend a few days together. So I won't be here Wednesday night, but Brother Ben Seaboat will be taking the service. So remember him in prayer, and we'll be back for the uh, Sunday service for New Year's Eve. Amen. When we look at this scripture, I, I, I look at this and I, I remember whenever we get to this season of time, I always reflect on all the Christmas messages that Brother Branham preached. Some of the greatest messages that were ever preached were at Christmas time. And I love the way Brother Branham preached his Christmas messages because, you know, while, while so much of the world, I mean, even in his day, were preaching about an event that had transpired 2,000 years ago, Brother Branham would take the event that transpired 2,000 years ago and he'd bring it right to our day. And he would show us that the same thing continues on, amen? And he preached... Uh, in 1960, he preached God's wrapped gifts, amen, showing us that God's gifts still come wrapped, amen. And how are they wrapped? They're wrapped behind a veil of flesh. God still has gifts in this day, but they're wrapped gifts, amen. And as Jesus was a wrapped gift, wrapped in swaddling cloth, which was what? Amen. It was the, it was, it was the, the, the fabric of the inside of a yoke. It was nothing, absolutely nothing that you would desire. No special garment, no, nothing of praiseworthy. It smelled like the ox. It was, it was rough, amen. But what was it? It was, it was the garment that Christ would be wrapped in, amen. And when the shepherds saw him, where, how would they seem? They would see a wrapped gift, amen? And it wasn't what the wrapping was, it was what was inside the, the wrapping that mattered. And inside this wrapping, it may be rough and it may be smelly and it may, but praise God, there's a gift inside. Amen. I, I love how Brother Branham could take Christmas, amen, and preach the message. Then in 1963, he preached, Why Little Bethlehem? He preached, We have seen a star and have come to worship him. Amen. We know in this day we have seen a star. Amen. The morning star showing the rising of the sun. And we have seen a star and come to worship him. And he says, and he preached, God's gifts always find their place. Places. That was good. In 1964, he preached, 
why it had to be shepherds. Had to be shepherds, amen? And he goes and preaches that. Amen, and, and we're gonna uh, read this scripture this morning. But I love those messages, and I, I didn't do it this year, but usually every, every year around December, I start going through all of them and listening to all of them. I didn't get a chance to do that this year, but they've always meant a lot to me, and I don't just listen to them at Christmas time. I, like, why Little Bethlehem? I listen to that all the time. That's an outstanding message. But this time, when the world is, is reflecting, the whole world is, is, is believing that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. They believe the story of the baby in the manger, amen. But as we just sang, amen, there's still a manger, amen. There's still, amen, a birth taking place, only now he's been being born in you and I, amen. So the story is just as relevant today as it's ever been. We, Brother Branham preached the message uh, and that message was calling him out of history. Amen? Calling him out of history. And I say today, let's call him out of history. Amen? Let's not just reflect on the historical acts of Jesus, but what's going on now. What does Christmas mean to us now? When Brother Branham come and preached it as the rising of the sun, amen, he, and he preached the Easter seal and the rising of the sun. These were Easter messages. And Brother Branham said, what does Easter mean? What does it mean to you and I? Amen? What does it mean to us today? Not that Jesus just rose 2,000 years ago, but what does Easter have to do with us today? And then Brother Branham started showing, hey, it's resurrection now, amen. We've been resurrected out of denominationalism. We've been brought, amen, into newness of life, into the word of the hour. He said, what a resurrection that was. What a resurrection this is. He says, now it's Easter with me and Jesus and you and I and Jesus. It's Easter with all of us. It's Easter, amen. So Brother Branham never left the historical events in history. He always brought it to our day and say, what was there is here, amen. What was there that day is here this day. Praise God. I love a present tense revelation because it gives us life today. So when we look at this, this scripture that we just read, the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks by night and the angel of the Lord uh, bathed them in the glory of the Lord and gave them a message. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen. This birth was a birth with a purpose. That's what I'm going to talk about to, today, born for a purpose. And then for a subtitle, I'd like to take preventing the manifestation. Born for a purpose he was born to save men from their sins. He was born to be the savior of the world. Amen. And we know to do that, he would give his life. So he was born to die in our place, to be the sacrificial lamb. He was born with a purpose. Let's pick up the story over here in verse 15. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them unto heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Amen. It's amazing that the shepherds, Brother Bram, when he preached why it had to be shepherds, he was talking about, he was talking about uh, men who were illiterate. They were uneducated. They were, they were uh, you know, not in the in group of society, but they were out a bit separated. And he talked about they were simple. Amen. They weren't the priest. They weren't the high priest. They weren't the well-educated. Amen. And these, these simple men, these simple shepherds that were out here doing the work of a shepherd, amen. And how, who else would recognize the birth of a lamb? Who else was there to attend the birth of lambs? This was the lamb of God coming to the earth. It's very fitting that the angel would notify the shepherds. The shepherds would need to know that there's a newborn lamb. Amen. But them being the simple men that they are, amen, they didn't say, let us go to Bethlehem and do some investigation and find out it's true. They believed it. As soon as the angel told them, they believed it. Let's say, let, let, they said, let's go see this thing that's been done. Oh, why did it have to be shepherds? Because they were simple enough to believe the angel's message, amen? And what are we to be? Not religious, amen? Not theologians, not highly educated. We need to be as simple and humble as the shepherds to recognize, amen, the angel's message is true. Let's go see this that's been done, amen? The word has returned. Let's not analyze it. Let's not take scientific analysis of it and see. No, let's go see it. It's done. It's here. Let's go witness this thing. Why well, it had to be shepherds because shepherds could receive this message. Verse 16, and they came in haste 
and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So the first earthly herald of the newborn king was shepherds. Simple, humble shepherds. Who did God send with the message of the birth of Christ? Amen. To their fellow man. He sent the angel to the shepherds. He sent the shepherds to everybody else in Bethlehem. And they wondered at what these shepherds were talking about. Not, they're not the normal oracles, amen, for the word of God. They weren't, the, they weren't the customary, amen, oracles that they were used to hearing great messages from God from. Amen. But they were exactly right on par with what God wanted. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We, not, we may not be much, amen. We may not be the upper crust of society, but praise be to God. If we can be like shepherds, we can run through the city proclaiming that Christ is here, amen. He is here. And the message, shalom. Brother Bram says, that son is the word of God. The beginning, God said, let there be light. And when the manifested word of God, when the word of God was manifested, there was light. First God spoke it. What if it didn't manifest? Then it wasn't light yet. But when he spoke it and then it was manifested, vindicated, his word was a vindicated, light came into existence. And that's the only way it can be done now is when the word is vindicated, God's written word vindicated, then it shows light. It's a, it's a portion is lit or put out for each age. We find in the church ages, we find in the Old Testament church ages, each time that there came a time, a certain manifestation of the journey, there was a prophet came to earth and the word came to the prophet and he made that word live. And when that word was identified, it reflected God. And there was the age, there was the light, and that's the way light comes today. How? When God, when it's, a, when it's a time for another age, another dispensation, God would send a prophet, the prophet would declare the word, amen, and, and that word would be vindicated and it became the light for that age. There was a prophecy, amen, a prophecy laying in the word that a virgin shall conceive. A child shall be born unto us, amen, and, and, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. We know that these prophecies are laying there. There was a prophecy all the way back in Genesis chapter three that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. So there's been a prophecy of this seed coming down all through. And now it was a word, it was a word, it was a word, but now it's manifested word. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so now we see that Jesus says, let's turn together to John chapter eight together and let's look at this. John chapter 8, verse 12. In John 8, verse 12, he says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen. What made him the light of the world? Because he was the manifested word for his day. He was that prophecy. He was that word, the prophecy from Genesis 3, the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 7, the prophecy from Isaiah 53. All these prophecies were wound up in him, and now he wasn't, he wasn't just the word because the word was already there. He was the manifested word. And he says, I am the light of the world, amen, and he was the manifested word. Amen. And that's where the rub always comes, friends. Where it always starts a battle, it always starts a war, war, is when the word comes into manifestation. Amen. Because once the word goes forth, the spoken word of God, the devil can do nothing to retract that word. That word's already been spoken. And a spoken word of God will go out there and circle around the earth. Amen. That's what Brother Branham said. Amen. Isaiah said, a virgin shall conceive. That word went forth and that word was circling around the globe, waiting till that word could drop. And it's Appointed time and it's appointed place. Amen. And he can't stop that word from moving around. But what he's trying to do is prevent the manifestation. Amen. Because the manifestation of that word brings light and light brings life. Yeah. Amen. amen. When, when, uh, when Jesus, when God, amen, told uh, his, his uh, new form son, he says, go forth, multiply and replenish. 
Amen. That was the word of God. The spoken word was given to the son and his son's wife to multiply and replenish. Amen. And he can't stop that word. He can't stop that word that God spoke as a prophecy. Amen. But what does the devil do? He comes to mar the manifestation and he comes and he gets into the womb of the woman. Amen. To try to disrupt the manifestation of that word because the manifestation of the word brings life. This is what the devil has always tried to do. He began to, to, to try to either prevent or pervert or, or, or sometime hold back the manifestation of that word because when the word comes in the manifestation, amen, it begins to end something for him. Yeah. Amen. It, let's go to John chapter 3. Look at another scripture here. He said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me walketh shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John chapter 3, verse 19 says, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. This is the reason that the devil would always use these who hate the light to try to put out the light. Because the light was a reproof to them. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Matthew 2, verse 1 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Why was he troubled, amen? Here was the prophecy coming to fulfillment. Here were these wise men coming, saying the time of the prophecy is now at hand. But Herod, who loved darkness and not light, he was troubled because the word was coming into manifestation. And now, <clears throat> uh, verse 4, and then he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I might come and worship him also. So here is Herod. He's sitting. He's a tetrarch. He's sitting as a king, amen, over uh, Judea. And, and when he finds out that the wise men come with a, with a message, amen, that we've seen the sign in the heavens, amen, we've seen the star declaring the birth of Christ, amen, all of a sudden he's troubled, amen. This, this is perplexing to him because now Christ has come, amen, for the rest of the world, for those who are trapped in darkness and want light, this is the greatest thing that we could ever hear. For the shepherds, it was a wonderful message. For Herod, it was perplexing and troubling. So he... He feigns that he wants to worship him. So he says, go and, and, and diligently seek out the child. I mean, before he sends him, he asks, when did this star appear? Why, when did you first see the sign in the heaven? He's trying to determine when Jesus was born. And he's acting super interested in the word and the fulfillment of prophecy. And he is very interested in the fulfillment of prophecy, not because he loves light, but because he loves darkness. And he's afraid of the light. Now we go down to verse 16 after the wise men left by another way being warned of God. Verse 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew, <coughs> excuse me, slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Amen. Not only was he troubled about the birth of the word, he was trying to kill it. This is the condemnation to the world that light has come to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
He didn't love the fulfillment of the word. He didn't love the prophecy coming to manifestation. No matter what he pretended to like it, no matter what kind of religious ceremony or whatever kind of religious pretense he put on, when it came down to it, when the prophecy moved from the spoken word prophecy to manifestation, now he had to kill the manifestation. And this has been the tactic of the devil all the way through. He's trying to stop that manifestation, amen, and we know that he can't stop it, amen. He's only been attempting to stop it, but we see all of his efforts from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden all the way through to today, he's trying to stop the manifestation of the word. But what God has spoken, amen, will come to pass, amen. Nothing will stop the manifestation of the word, but he's sure on a rampage to try to stop it, to squelch it, amen, to, to do all he can to discredit it, disprove it, amen, put a black mark upon it. He's trying to keep everybody away from the manifestation. Amen, let's go to John chapter 18. You know, I first titled this uh, Born with a Purpose, and I want to look at what Jesus says here. In John chapter 18, he's standing before Pilate. He's been arrested, he's put on trial. He's undergoing questioning from Pilate. And in John chapter 18, verse 37, he says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. Jesus had just said, my kingdom is not from the earth. My kingdom's from above. If my kingdom was from earth, my subjects would fight for me. But my kingdom's not from here. My kingdom's from above. And he says, thou art a king. He says, you say that I'm a king. But then look what Jesus says. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Why was Jesus born? To bear witness of the truth. This is what he says, to this end was I born. This is the reason that I've been born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Amen. What was the purpose of Jesus? We know he's born to be the Savior. He's born to be the Lamb of God. He's born to take away the sins of the world. That's all the purpose. But when Jesus stands before Pilate, he said, this is the reason I came into the world. For this purpose I was born, to bear witness of the truth. Amen. And everybody that loves the truth will hear my voice. Amen. If that was Jesus' purpose, I want that to be my purpose. Amen. Why have I been born again? Amen. My first birth, I come into the earth, but God knew when I would be planted. God knew what time I would come. And he planted a seed in this earth. And down in my soul was a seed gene of God. And he knew when it would come forth. He knew what vessel it would be trapped in. And he knew what journey I would be on and where in the journey that he would meet that seed and bring it to life. But I've been born again. Amen. This is the reason I've been born. This is the reason to bear witness of the truth. That's the reason I've been born again. That's the reason and I've encountered this message. That's the reason the light of this hour has struck this seed and brung it to life is so that I can bear witness of the truth. That's why he came. That's why we've come. Amen. We've been born for a purpose and born again for the purpose of God. But just as the devil never was welcoming to the manifestation of the word, he's still not today. Amen. Jesus, I, I want to... I want to look at John chapter 8. I'm flipping back and forth in John here, but I like the book of John. The, when you look at the four gospels, John is the bride's gospel. Through and through. Amen. It's got the eagle anointing on it. Amen. So John chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, so there was a whole slew of Jews that believed on him. They would eventually fade away, amen, but they were believing on him at this point. And here's what he says. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make, shall make you free. Oh, my goodness. And you know what? This was perplexing to the Jews because the next statement, they say, we're Abraham's children and never were in bondage to any man. How can you say you'll make us free? Amen. They were looking at a natural condition and he was looking at a spiritual condition. And he says, I will speak the truth. Amen. <clears throat> Let's see it again. Uh, if 
You continue in my word. This is why Brother Branham said, you know, Judas was walking in the word, but Judas couldn't continue in the word. He couldn't go all the way to Pentecost. Amen. That's why Brother Branham said the greatest evidence I know of, of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, amen, is being able to go all the way with the word. Not getting hung up somewhere. Amen. Judas got hung up somewhere. Many got hung up somewhere. Demas got hung up somewhere and could no longer continue with Paul. Amen. But not that you just can believe because he's saying these were the Jews who believed on him. But if you continue all the way through, that's the greatest evidence that Brother Branham knew of, of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he said, if you continue in the, my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. What brings freedom is the truth. Jesus, he says, to this end that I was born and for this cause I came into the world to bear witness of the truth. Because it's the truth that makes us free. Amen. Religion doesn't make us free. A, a, a United States Constitution doesn't make us free. But the truth makes us free. Amen. We're thankful for the privileges that we have living in the United States. We can worship the way we want. We can live where we want. We've got a lot of freedoms. Amen. But there's so many people that are free in the United States and they're bound in their soul, bound in their spirit realm, bound by traditions of men, bound by all kinds of deception, bound by lies and, and all kinds of traditional teachings of men with no understanding of God, with their mind alienated, darkened to the things of God, bound by all kinds of addictions, bound by all kinds of habits bound by all kinds of past yeah. issues. Amen. But he said, the truth shall make you free. I thank God that he's given us the truth Amen. so that we can experience real freedom. Amen. Jesus came into this world to bear witness of the truth. I believe that's why we're here. To bear witness of the truth. In the message paradox, Brother Bram says, John came upon the earth. He was the manifested word of God for that hour. We know that. He was God's manifested word. Because why? Isaiah said there would be a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Malachi, the last prophet, said, Behold, I send my messenger before my face to prepare the way before the people. So what was, what, what was John? But, uh, Jesus says John was a light. And you were happy to walk in that light for a season. He wasn't the light. He was bearing witness of the light. He was a lesser light showing the great light. He was a light. Why was he a light? Amen. Because he was the word made manifest for his day. That's what made him the light. And God's provided a place of worship. He said, that what say, how do you know he was a prophet? The word come to the prophet, and he was the manifested word of God for his age. So when the word come to the prophet, and the prophet declared that word, amen, he was the manifested word of God for that hour, and, and Jesus said he was a light. Yeah. Amen. When God would call the apostle Paul, on the road to Damascus, he would call him a chosen vessel. And he'd say, he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. He was to bear or carry the name of Christ and take it into the darkness of the Gentiles. And he was to be a light. Amen. He was actually called to be a light. He was going to be the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah 49. In, in Acts 13, let's turn there together and look at this. In Acts 13, he and Barnabas are going along and they're preaching to the Jews as they move around in a missionary journey. And the Jews now are going to reject them. Acts 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God sh should first have been spoken to you. But seeing that you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation 
unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Amen. When Paul, amen, when he come, Paul and Barnabas come preaching what? The truth, amen. They were there bearing witness of the truth, amen. And God told, God told Paul he was to be a chosen vessel to bear his name before the Gentiles and kings, amen. And now he, he, he comes and he, and he says, we are a light unto the Gentiles for salvation unto the end of the earth. God had told him, what is that? That's quoting Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49 was now coming into manifestation in the apostle Paul. It was the word made flesh. Amen. Amen. And who is the light of the world? It's Christ. But Christ was working in Paul. Amen. Amen. So now he's claiming Isaiah, he's claiming God spoke Isaiah 49 over him. He's now standing here saying that he's the fulfillment of Isaiah 49. And Isaiah 49 was to be a light, amen, coming to the Gentiles, amen, because the word made manifest for your day is the light of the age. And now he's there bearing witness of the truth, bringing the light of the age. And what happens? Immediately the Gentiles that were ordained to life, amen, they came to life. Why? Because light brings life, amen. When there was, when was deadness upon this earth, when it was under judgment in Genesis 1-2 and darkness covered the face of the deep, God first was going to speak a word and that spoken word was that there'll be light because life comes by light. And Jesus was the word and in him was life and that life was the light of men. And so now the apostle Paul is claiming to be a light unto the Gentiles. Why? Because he's bearing record of the life of Christ. And it brings them to life. Let's look at Galatians chapter one. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. Paul says here, For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above mine equals and mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me. We've been through this before, but I have to highlight it, friends, because it's so perfect. He didn't say when God finally decided to reveal his son to me. Of course, he revealed the son to him, but that wasn't the purpose of his calling. He called him so that he could reveal his son in me. Amen. Where was the sun revealed? In Paul. Amen. Where was the light? It was shining through Paul. Paul was now a carrier of this truth. Amen. He came, he was born for a purpose. Amen. He knew that God had separated him from his mother's womb and let him go. But when the due season was along, that God was going to inject himself into Paul's life. Amen. Because he's a chosen vessel unto God, chosen before the foundation of the world to do what? Amen. To bear record of the truth, to shine forth the light. Amen. So that the son would be revealed in Paul, not to Paul. And I'm telling you, friends, the son has been revealed to us in this day through a prophetic ministry at the end time. But that son was not just to be revealed to us, but in this day, the son is to be revealed in us. Where is the sun supposed to be shining? Where is the light of the world supposed to be? It's supposed to be contained in earthen vessels because we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency might be of God and not of man. We've been born for a purpose, to testify of the truth. God told Paul that he... As he was getting to the end of his ministry, he got arrested and had rejection. And, and, and God says, don't worry. You're going to bear witness of me in Jerusalem as well. What was he doing? Testifying of the truth. You know, in, in Paul, if we just look at the life of Paul, he had it pretty good, you know. He, before his conversion, I should say. B.C., before conversion. Paul B.C. had it pretty good. 
zealous for the traditions of the fathers, come from good stock, come from a good family. Uh, uh, his religion was all tucked in nice and in order, and he was getting uh, accolades and compliments and positions and prestige all because of his religious duty and service. Amen. But when God, who separated him from his mother's womb, saw fit to reveal his son in him, he, he, he totally messed up his whole life. Because he was born for this purpose. He wasn't born to propagate the traditions of the fathers. He was born to bear witness of the light. And you know, when Paul had this massive conversion where he met Jesus Christ in the pillar of fire, he spoke to Jesus Christ, amen, lip to ear. He had this uh, magnificent uh, encounter and when he came out of this encounter, amen, he knew, he knew where he went wrong and he knew what was wrong with what he was doing. And he instantly knew who Christ was. And all of a sudden, so much of the scripture started unlocking to Paul that immediately he goes into Damascus and starts in the synagogue, amen, confounding them, teaching from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Why? Because an encounter with the light turns on the light. There was a man there that could turn on the light. And when the light got switched on for Paul, all of a sudden those scrolls that he had read and read and then the school of Gamal sitting at the feet of Gamal, he had memorized certain passages and he knew certain things and he had it all misplaced and he had it all in the wrong context. And now and the things that he was hoping for, he was fighting against. He was trying to kill, amen, and keep in darkness the very light that was the fulfillment of the scriptures that he loved. But then he come in contact with a man that could flip on the light. Amen. Brother Brennan preached the message. There's a man here that can turn on the light. Amen. And when you look at that message, Brother Brennan starts to break it down and type it. He says, there was a, there, there's a, in the Carlsbad Caverns, you go way down under the ground. And down under the earth, there's a little cave in there. Amen. And it's so dark in there. There's no light in there. Amen. And, and then there was a guide. And the guide was going along. And at some point in the tour, he'd flip off the light. And it was so dark, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. You remember the story? Amen. And there was a, little, a, a boy and a girl down there, a, a brother and a sister. Amen. And, and when they flipped the light off, the sister went into hysterics. She was frightened. She began to scream. Amen. But the little boy knew the guide could turn on the light. The little boy knew who was in control of the light. And the little boy said, don't fear, little sister. There's a man here that can turn on the light. And this is the whole basis for Brother Bram preaching this message. There's a man here that can turn on the light. And Brother Bram said, I know of another little sister, amen, our church that's in hysterics because it's so dark, amen. And so you've got to look at this whole story playing out. Here's the little sister in the cabin. But the little sister wasn't alone because in the darkness, there was an older brother, amen. There was a brother Branham. There was a prophet, the older brother to the sister who knew the guide was here who could turn on the light and who was calling to the sister in this dark age it was the older brother the prophet of the age saying don't be afraid little church shalom it's good morning there's a man here that can turn on the light amen where were they they were in a little room under the earth down under our earth, there's a little cave called the soul. Amen. And light hadn't shined on it yet. It was dark. But there's a guide that's present today. And there's an older brother saying, don't fear. There's a man here that can turn on the light. That's what the apostle Paul met on the road to Damascus. He met the man that could turn on the light. Who was it? It was the guide. Who's the guide? The Holy Ghost. Who is the Holy Ghost? It's the life of God. It's the life of Jesus Christ. And there's a man here that could turn on the light. Amen. And when the man turned on the light, all of a sudden, Paul could see. And he runs into Damascus, the very place that he was going to go to arrest Christians, to snuff out the light. Now he goes into the synagogues and preaches to the Jews and confounds them, teaching from the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Why? Paul was born to bear witness of the light. He was born to bear that name. He was born to carry that light. He was born to bear witness of the truth. When everything changed for Paul, so drastically changed, 
He had met the pillar of fire. He had met the same pillar of fire that Moses met in a burning bush. He had met the same pillar of fire that led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And you would think that all of his old religious buddies would have been happy for him. You would have thought the high priest and the elders and, and those, the students in the school of Gamaliel, they would be so thrilled, amen, that Paul come in contact with the same pillar of fire that they believed, the same pillar of fire that they loved, the same one that spoke to Moses. But no, amen, now when, when the light was flipped on for Paul, now Paul's carrying the light. Now it proves that they hate the light because they're children of the darkness. And what do they immediately try to do? They start trying to stop the manifestation of Isaiah 49. They don't just let him go on and preach what he wants to preach and do what he wants to do and say it's fine. No. What immediately what they tried to do is they try to stop this manifested word from shining light. This has always been the devil's tactic. Amen. When it was time for a deliverer to be born down in Goshen in Egypt, amen, there was a prophecy laying there. And the prophecy was showing that after 400 years, God would bring him out with the mighty hand. And they knew that God was going to send a deliverer to bring them out. And when the time got to approaching near to where this baby needs to be born, all of a sudden there was an anointing that struck Pharaoh. Amen. Where did that anointing come from on Pharaoh? Where he decided, amen, these people are multiplying too much. We need to to kill them. And instead of killing all of them, they said, let's just kill the males. Let's just destroy the sons of the Hebrews. What was that anointing? That was the anointing of the devil trying to stop the manifestation of the promised word. That's what he's always tried to do. That's what he tried to do with, with Eve. That's what he tried to do in the Exodus journey. That's what he tried to do down in Bethlehem when Herod sent his soldiers down there to destroy all the children to and under. What's he trying to do? He's trying to stop the manifestation of the word. He couldn't stop the word. It was already spoken. When Herod gathered the, the scribes and the priests to gather them together and say, where will this child be born? They knew. They had the word. They knew in Bethlehem. They knew the prophecy. He couldn't stop that. So what was he trying to stop? Because he couldn't stop the word. He tried to stop the manifestation of the word. Because it's the manifestation of the word that brings life. That's what the devil hates. As long as we can keep it and prof prophetic word and keep it away from manifested word, the devil can deal with that. He's been dealing with it for years. He brings confusion, different interpretations, different ideas. And he, as long as he can, he can't stop it from going forth. It's already gone forth. So he, he, he tries to just hold it here. Just don't let that prophesied word move into manifested word because that's dangerous for the devil. Amen. Herod felt secure until the prophecy come into manifestation. Then his insecurity began to show. <clears throat> In the message, Shalom, the prophet said, Our Heavenly Father, we now bring to you every hand that's up everywhere, and let the Holy Ghost of God bring to them the rhythm of the word and its truth, that they are to be molded now into sons and daughters of God, and they are to be the reflecting of the light of God upon the earth. They are to be the manifested word. Oh, I'm going to say something in just a minute. They are to be the reflecting of the light of God upon the earth. What are we supposed to be? Whatever Paul was, we're supposed to be. They are to be the reflecting of the light of God upon the earth. They are to be the manifested word. That men and women are to live the way Jesus lived and to believe every word of God and live by it like he did. This, this what, what I'm, I'm dealing with and what, I, what, what I'm laboring in and what's in my heart, we, we cannot just be message believers and do any damage to the kingdom of Satan. We cannot just be believers of a truth and believers of a word and believers of a prophecy. I mean, we must be believers, don't get me wrong. 
But if we stop at just believing or identifying that this is truth, I know this, this, this is truth, amen, the, the believing has to move into manifestation. And instead of, I, I, I don't want to say anything wrong, I'm so afraid that I'm always going to be mistook, but you all know me by now, so don't mistake me. We, we've got to move from being message believers to being the message. Because the prophet came to forerun something. And he couldn't come to forerun a manifestation. He came to forerun a declaration, a happening upon the earth. Amen. And that what he came to forerun was the coming of the Lord. And he came as an Eliezer to unite the head and the body, the bridegroom and the bride. Amen. And he did his work. He united together. And now that was the premise of the message. Amen. Was the bride coming of Christ. But that can't just be something we talk about. That can't be something we just believe in. But that has to translate into a life. It has to come to life. And it has to become light. Because Brother Branham said, when, when God said, let there be light, amen, that was the word. It was the spoken word of God. And in that spoken word of God was the power to produce itself. He said, but you could question the word. You could talk about it. You could discuss it. Amen. But and it, it didn't bring any seeds to life when he said, let there be light. Amen. Potentially, it was all there. It was all in the power of God's word. Amen. But it had to forego a transformation from spoken word to manifested word. And when it was manifested word, it was light. And that light brought life to the seeds. Amen. We can talk, but talk is cheap. We can claim we believe things, but when the press really comes on, what do we really believe? It has to move from, it has to move from word to manifested word. Let's look back again in John, John 15. Let's just spend a little bit of time in this. We had the, the spoken word of God in the prophecies in the Old Testament about the seed that would come, the son that would be born. We had all those prophecies. But really what started trouble was when the prophecy moved into manifestation. That really started a whole load of trouble. If you think about it, listen, if we just stop and think, how many babies died? in Bethlehem? How many mothers cried? Huh? I mean, think of all the trouble that came because the word came into manifestation and the devil wanted to stop that manifestation. I, I, I'll go out on a limb. I'm going to go out on a big limb. But here we are in 2023, getting ready to move into 2024. And the devil is still trying to stop the manifestation of the sons of God. And you think that abortion being legalized in America was just, no, he's trying to stop you and I from coming forward. Every tactic, every, not just abortion, but, but all the things that have flooded the earth, all the things that have flooded your mind, all the things that have happened in your path, all the troubles that have come. What do you think the devil's afraid of? He's afraid of the manifestation of this promised word. Amen. Amen. Let's look at John 15, verse 26. But when the comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth. What did Jesus come? Why was he born? For this reason I came to earth, to bear record of the truth, to bear witness of the truth. Amen. Now, what is the Spirit going to come to do? Amen. The Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, amen, is the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father. He shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Amen. What is the, what is the Holy Ghost? He is the Spirit of truth. What's he coming to do? Bear witness of the truth. What were the disciples to do? Bear witness of the truth. What are we here to do under the new birth, under the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the Spirit of truth? We are here to bear witness of the truth. We are following in Christ's line. That's why Jesus said in Acts, when he was speaking to the disciples after his resurrection, before his ascension, he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. 
You know, he didn't say, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come on you and you'll have gifts and sensations and that'll be really exciting and a real blessing for you. You understand? No, because the spirit of truth has come because you're now going to be the witness. You're going to be the light on the earth. You're going to bear record of the truth. You have come to come into manifestation. And now the Holy Ghost comes to empower you to be witnesses. Amen. And in the message, God's provided place of worship. He says, now we find that in each age when God said a certain thing, thing would happen, here come that man along and manifest that. And, and I'm going to read this again because I want you to stay with me because the wording here is amazing. He said, when we find that in each age, now let's talk about our age. When God said a certain thing would happen, here come that man along and manifested that. So are we all up to date? God said a certain thing would happen, amen, and he prophesied it in Malachi 4, Luke 17, 30, and Revelation 10, 7, and here come that man, which was Brother Branham, and he manifests that. So we're all on the same page. The next thing he says, here come their people, their people, what people? The people that went along with these men who began to manifest the word. But the seven church age messengers, they had their people, right? Moses had his people, amen? David had his people. Every time God prophesied something would come, when it would come, there come the man that would manifest that, and then their people came. Are we on the same page? All right. So, and here come their people along and live that. So what are you and I here to do? We're to live that message that prophet preached, amen? Not just, he says, what is the token? Not just coming together and talking about the message, but getting under it. What is the token? The very life of the message coming into me. To what? To live out the life of the word. What? I, I am one of those people, amen? I'm not ashamed to say I'm one of those people. I'm not a Wesleyan, amen? I'm not a Lutheran, amen? But I'm a message believer of the end time message. God sent a prophet according to the prophecies in the word of God. According to Malachi 4, it's in Luke 17, 30, God sent a man to fulfill that. Amen. And there's people that follow that message, and I'm one of those people. And when he said their people, I am their people. Yeah. There is included because T H E I, there I am, are. Amen. Do you find yourself in that statement? Now their people came and lived it. I'm not just here to play a tape and then to keep walking on the earth as I am and to play another tape and say, oh, that's good word and read another message and come to another service and say, boy, that's a good word. That's exciting. Did you see how I connected that scripture with that scripture? I never seen that before. And you know, friends, that's amazing and that's wonderful and we should all get excited. We all do get excited. Every true believer gets excited about that, but it's got to move from the enthusiasm of seeing a fulfillment of the word and now we've got to take that word and be the fulfillment of that word. When he constructs us on how to live, we live it, amen. When he tells us how to honor God, we do that to honor God. When he tells us what's right and what's wrong, amen, their people take that word and live it. Amen. And so he, I'm going to read it again now that we understand what's being said. He says, we find in each age when God said a certain thing would happen, here come that man along and manifested that. Here come their people along and live that. That's what I want to be. I want to be one of their people that live that. I want to be associated and attached to this word that came and not just say, I have a mental agreement with it. I think it's all right. But I want to manifest my faith in that word by living it. I want to live the message. He said, then look at the next statement after he says this. That was God himself living in the people. Because it was an answering of his word. Praise be to God. When their people take that word, amen, that was manifest and preached through those men. When their people take it and live it, that's God himself being manifest in the people. Why? Because it's the word and God is the word. And when the word's made manifest, amen, it's manifesting God. Praise God. 
2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's turn here together. <clears throat> you know, Christmas is wonderful. Easter is wonderful. All of these things that we celebrate are wonderful. But if there's not a birth in me, what's the point of my worship and celebration? Easter's wonderful, but if there's not a resurrection in me, I'm just celebrating a religious ceremony. I'm going to church and putting on a nice suit and I'm going to eat a Christmas turkey or a ham or whatever we, we do and I'm just going to go through the religious motions like so many others. No, it's Easter's got to be brought up today. Let's call him out of history. Amen, that was Easter. What a resurrection that was. Now let's go to the next statement. What a resurrection this is. What a birth of the word that was. What a birth of the word this is. That was the birth of the word, the fullness of the word come into birth, amen, but the word has come back and being born in sons and daughters of God by the new birth, amen, let the birth be in me now. Let there be a Christmas in my heart. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse two. Paul says, ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Brother Brandon refers to this so many times about being written epistles. It says, for as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. You're the epistle of Christ. When we read, you know, when we say turn to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians, those are the epistles, Right? So when we, when we turn to Ephesians, that's the epistle to Paul. What's epistle? It's a letter. It's a letter he wrote to the Ephesians. When you, the epistle of 1 and 2 Corinthians, the epistle of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, those are epistles. And those epistles were written, amen, by Paul and by Peter and by various ones. But there's an epistle that's written of Christ. That's what he says. Let's, let's look at it again. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of your heart, where Christ himself has come and written this epistle in you. It was ministered by Paul, but it was Christ writing the word in your heart. And now you're to be a written epistle read of all men. Now men are going to read. What are they going to read? They can't open up your heart and see what the Spirit describes. They're reading your life, and in reading your life, they're reading the epistle that Christ wrote on the inside. How will men read this epistle that Christ wrote in me? They will read it by my conduct, my actions. Amen. The way that I conduct and live my life is an epistle written. The question is, is it the writing of Christ that was written in the fleshly tables of my heart? Or is it some other writing that I'm declaring to the world? In Matthew 5, let's turn there together. Matthew 5 and verse 14. Matthew 5 and 14 says, ye are the light of the world. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But now he's looking at the disciples, you're the light of the world. What makes them the light of the world? When they are the word made manifest, they are the light of the world. What's that mean? When they're living the word for their day, they're the light of the world. He said, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What is he talking about? What kind of light? It's a life lived before men. That's it. The light lived before men. That is your light. Brother Bram said in the message, turn on the light. No life can come outside of light. Light produces, light produces life. 
There can be no life outside of light, natural or spiritual. There must be. And only light can come by the word of God. God's word is a light when it's manifested. So life only comes by light. Brother Ben said, life comes by light. And God's word is light when it's manifested. So what purpose were we born for? Why were we born again? Why are we here? To manifest the light. Because light brings life. This world is steeped in darkness, but we're here to manifest the word. We've been given the word to manifest the word. We've not been given the word to keep it in a pocket. We've not been given the word just to keep it in our mind. We've been given the word to live. And when that word by the spirit of God is manifest, fleshed out in our life, it is the light of the age. And light brings life. Paul became the light to the Gentiles. His old friends didn't like it anymore. His old buddies in seminary, the high priest and the elders, they didn't like it anymore. So what did they try to do? They tried to stop him from manifesting light. We're going to get down to the, to the challenge of the day. The challenge of the day is for us to manifest the light, but the devil hates the manifested word. That's what he's fighting. He's fighting us. Amen. He's fighting us to what? To not manifest the word. Brother Ben made a couple statements here, that, and then I want to get into a, another thought. In the trial, he said, Lord, we believe this to be the last commission to the church. We believe that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we believe that any man is no better than his word. Therefore, we believe that the word is you. And we believe that it is you, which the same yesterday, today, and forever. Come today, O Father God, in the form of the word to us, and let the people see that thou art the risen Christ. And raised in this last day, in the form that you said you would be in, the manifested word. Is he raised in the last day? Yes. In what form? In the form of the manifested word. Then he says, he said in the message, things that are to be, he said, what is the word, bride? The manifestation of this hour. What is she? She is the manifested word for today. Which if she's the manifested word, then she is to be the light of the world in this generation. And light brings life. Amen. But you know, those in darkness hate the light. Satan hates the light. There was a <clears throat> quote that Brother Ron read last Sunday, and I was meditating on it as he was reading it there. I've been thinking about it all week, and I'm going to go, I'm going to read it again. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, he says, nowadays there, we, 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 don't believe in saying hell in the pulpit or mercy or so blah. We need men of God who won't hold back. Now, everybody can't be a preacher, but you got a voice. And if you can't preach the people a sermon, if you're a preacher, you're called to the pulpit to preach. If you're not, you're still a preacher. But live the people a sermon. Let your sermon be lived. And it's the voice of God that'll bring reproach to them who reject it. Why? Because it'll be the word made manifest in our lives, our holiness, our conduct, our, our reverence to God, all of these things that are manifest in our life, amen, it's, it's a sermon that's lived, amen, and it's an epistle that's read of all men. Amen. He said, now, he says, uh, he said, oh my goodness, I've lost my space. Anyways, he said, if you're a preacher, you're called to the pulpit to preach. If you're not, you're still a preacher, but live the people a sermon. Let your sermon be lived, and it's the voice of God that'll bring reproach to them who reject it. They say no one could put a finger on his or her life. They're sweet living. If there ever was a man of God, it's that man or woman, or that woman. See, live your sermons. Don't try to preach them if you're not called to be a preacher. You'll get all mixed up anyhow and messed up, and you'll get people tangled up, and you know. He said, you'll ruin them and yourself too. Just live your sermon. The preacher's called to preach his and to live it too. So nobody gets out of living it. 
Even if you're a preacher, you're called to live it too, not just stand and proclaim it. Amen. If you proclaim it and have no life, stop proclaiming it until you have the life that you're proclaiming from. Amen. And live it too. If you can't live it, then you stop preaching it. But, you, but you're supposed to live your sermons. All right. Here was voices. Oh, how we need in Jeffersonville thousands of lived voices, the thunder of God thundering out in sweetness and holiness, purity, undefiled lives, walking around in the earth today without a blemish. Yes, sir. Real Christians. That's the thunder against the enemy. The devil don't care how loud you can holler. The devil don't care how much you can jump or how much you can do this or shout. But what hurts the devil is to see that sanctified, holy life consecrated to God. Say anything to him, call him anything, just as sweet as it can be and move right on. Oh my, that throws him away. That's the thunder that shakes the devil. Why? Because that's the word made manifest. That's what he's been fighting from Genesis all the way down through. He can't fight the spoken word. He's fighting the manifested word. He's trying to prevent it, pervert it, God, hold it down, discredit it, darken it, give it an ugly name. He's trying anything he can to get the people away from the manifested word because the manifested word is the light that'll bring life. He said, he says, now he goes on and he says, well, you say if I could preach like Billy Graham or Oral Roberts or somebody, a great influential speaker, oh no, sometimes the devil just laughs at that. He don't pay no more attention to that than nothing. You get all the theology you want to and all the seminary training and the devil just sit back and laugh at it. But when he sees that life, what causes him to tremble? That life. What causes him to back up? That life. What, 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 what's he trying to shut down? That life. Amen. And if that's the thunder that shakes the devil, if that's the thing that hurts the devil, if that's the voice of God thundering out in sweetness and holiness, amen, then where is the battleground today? Amen. You can say the battleground is, is over. Amen. Oh, I don't even know what we would say, what the world would say, where the battleground is over truth. But I'll tell you where the battleground is. The battleground is right in your life, the devil trying to stop you from manifesting the word. That's where the fight is taking place because that's what he wants to stop. Amen. He's tried to discredit the message. Amen. He's tried to prove by, by, by proofs and evidences that Brother Brennan was wrong and he, he may continue to try that attack. Amen. The problem that he's having is no matter what discrepancies he shows, there's a life being manifest that that message was the truth. The Apostle Paul says, you are our epistles, amen. You are the letter. You are the evidence, read of all men, amen. You were ministered by us, but written by Christ in your heart, amen. And the same exact thing is true today, amen. The evidence of the message is not, amen, the testimonies that we can piece together, and it's not our understanding. No, the evidence of the message, amen, is the message was calling forth for Christ to come in the formation of the bride, that there would be a people on the earth that would manifest the very life of Jesus Christ, that's the evidence that the message is true. That's the battleground. That's the fight. That's where the devil's fighting. Amen. It, 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 we tried to defend the message and say, no, there was 16 men on the bridge. No, there's a testimony that men fell on the bridge. How many? They didn't count them, just a bunch of men. In the, hey, listen, forget that argument. You're never going to prove anything by trying to prove details and testimony. Forget all of that. If you want to prove the message, then you take that message in your heart, surrender your life to Christ, and say, God, transform that word into to my life. And that's the epistle that's read of all men. That's the testimony that this message is the truth. It's the word made manifest in our lives. That's the fight, friends. That's where the battle is right there, trying to get you, amen, quiet, trying to get you discredited, trying to get you cold and indifferent, trying to keep you from being red hot, on fire, sold out, absolutely consecrated and dedicated to this message. That's the battle. That's why Laodicea is trying to creep in constantly. That's why entertainments are always moving in. That's why disappointments and discouragements is piling on top of you. He's trying to stop the manifestation of the word in your life. That's the battle. And when we don't recognize the battle, amen, we start falling into all kinds of traps. You know, Brother Bram said in spoken words, the original seed, he said, Jesus was born to destroy the works of the devil. 
That's what he was born for, to destroy the works of the devil. He said his body is to do the same. So what were you born for? To destroy the works of the devil. How are you going to destroy the works of the devil? Well, let's back up to the thunder that shakes the devil. Let's go to the thing that actually hurts the devil. It's that consecrated, sweet, humble life, sold out and dedicated to God. Amen. I say many times, I've said before, <clears throat> I said I think Wednesday, our struggle may not be poverty. Our struggle may not be religious persecution. Our struggle is soft living. Yes, right. Amen. And we all struggle with it. But I want to be aware of the devil in all of his tactics. But the says in the message, there's a man here that can turn on the light. He said, life is only by the word of God made manifest. I, I just love that. He says this over and over and over again. Life is only by the word of God made manifest. The word has to live. The word has to become light. Life comes only by the word of God made manifest. As long as it's in just in the book like this, it's still going to be questioned. But when it's made manifest, then you see the product of what he spoke of being manifested. Then that is light on the word. That's what brings the word said so. And then when it comes to pass, that is life in light. Light bringing life. Light brings life. What light? When the word takes on flesh and my flesh and begins to manifest the message of the hour, begins to live the word, amen, that brings a light and that light can bring life. That's what the devil doesn't want. He doesn't want your light to bring life to another seed. Remember when, when, remember when Gabriel came to Mary and Mary was told, amen, that she was going to now bear Christ. She was going to be the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 7, amen, and that was a hard thing for a, a little virgin girl from nowhere, a nobody from nowhere to absorb and to believe that, that you remember the prophecy you heard in Isaiah 7, a virgin shall conceive? Yeah, I've heard it all my life. It was a Sunday school uh, uh, memory verse that I, I got a star on my chart from remembering. And Gabriel says, that's you. You're that scripture. Isaiah was talking about you. God had you in mind before the foundation. I mean, that may not be the dialogue that took place, but that was the point of the conversation. And now this little girl, she had to come to terms with the fact that she was the word. In her flesh is going to be the manifestation of that word. That word was speaking about her. She is the manifestation. That word is going to come to light and bear light in her flesh. And you know what? Because she's a seed of God, she believed it, amen? She had some questions. She had some concerns. But after talking to the uh, angel, amen, the angel told her, you're it, and she believed it. She received it. You know what she became? She became the light of her hour. Is that right? She was the word made manifest. She was light. And that light can bring life. And now she finds out she's got a cousin. And that cousin also has a word inside of her. Amen. A predestinated word in her. Because there's a prophecy in Malachi 3. There's a prophecy in Isaiah of one that will prepare the way of the Lord that makes straight his path. There's a word. Now that word is laying in Elizabeth. We're on the same page. Now her cousin Elizabeth has the word in her. Now Mary has the word in her that's been quickened to life. The problem is Elizabeth has not felt the quickening power yet. This word is laying there dead in her womb. The word is in her, but the word has no life. It's dead. Brother Ben said she never felt the baby kick yet. It was dead. It was six months. She was starting to get concerned. I love the word of God. No doubt she had prayed. God, I don't feel anything. You promised in your word. Amen. Your, your angel said 
to Zechariah, amen, we know, we know that this is the, the, the one that's coming, and I don't feel anything. There's no change in my life. I, I, it feels dead like it's not alive, amen. And, and she could pray. She could ask Zechariah to pray. They may even fast and pray, amen. But what is it going to take? It's going to take that little virgin girl with the word awake inside of her, the manifested word for her day. When she comes in contact with Elizabeth and she begins to declare the message that she received, that this, I'm blessed of the Lord. I'm going to have a baby. His name is Jesus. And when she heard that word that had come to life and, 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 and Mary, the word in Mary that was alive brought the word laying dormant in Elizabeth and it sprung to life. Life came to life. Word came to word. Manifested word came to promise word and it sprung to life in her womb and started leaping and jumping around. You think your testimony doesn't do anything. It's your testimony that brings life. Amen? You're not just here to take up space. You're not just here to breathe oxygen in and out. You're not just here to retire and have a retirement. You're here to testify of the truth. That's why we were born. We have been born and we've come into this life to testify of the truth so that the truth in us being manifest can bring a seed that's laying dormant somewhere else to life. Let it be Christmas all over again. This is why the distractions of the world are so wicked. The prophet of God would come and warn us away from entertainment. He would warn us away from religion. He would warn us away from all the trappings of the world. He wasn't trying to bring us into legalism. He wasn't trying to make us, amen, into some monks or some nuns. What he was trying to do is break away all the little suckers that suck the life away, all the little distractions that distract us away from what our purpose and intent really is. Amen. And anytime somebody comes down and starts preaching about watching movies and going to these places and running around in entertainment, we start to say legalism. It isn't legalism. Those things are driving you away from the very purpose that you're here. Amen. Spending hours searching the web, all this time bringing nonsense into our minds. Amen. We've got to find out why am I here? What is the devil trying to do? He's trying to stop the manifestation in my life because the light in me can bring life. Bring life to a coworker, bring life to a family member. It can bring life. I believe I'm here. I believe with all my heart that I'm here to bear witness of the truth. I'm here to be a written epistle read of all men. That's why I'm here. Because you know what the devil doesn't want? He doesn't want a manifestation in my life. He'll bring, if he can't do it with pleasure, he'll do it with disappointment. How many of you have been disappointed? Rejected? Had situations you shouldn't have had with family members? Had difficult situation with other members in the church? How many have had things that discourage you, tie you up, lock you up, shut you down? I mean, what's the devil trying to do? He's trying to stop you from manifesting the word. Using trivial little petty things and disappointments and, and, and this person said this and this person did this. And, oh my, we got to rise above these things. We've got a work to do. We've got a calling. We've got to shed the light and the devil's trying to choke it down. Amen. Remember the seed that was sown. It fell into different types of soil, but one of them, it fell into where thorns sprung up and briars. And what did it do? It choked out the life. Amen. The devil's trying to use the circumstances in this life to choke out the life because he doesn't want that life life to manifest. We get tied up in all kinds of things. Amen. And, and some of those things are absolutely unavoidable. They happen. But I've been praying myself, God, help me not to lose my joy. Help me not to lose my vision. When things go sideways, God, help me not to forget my purpose in this planet. Amen. I want to be like Mary. I want to say the words come to life inside of me. This is the message I've heard. This is who I am. The word is now alive in me. And when I give that word, I want the word that's laying dormant in another child of God, amen, to spring to life. I want to bear witness of the truth. Oh, praise be to God. Let's all stand together. I just want to I'll share one more quote. 
Two more. Musicians, if you'll please come. Brother Matt said there is something about it that whenever you make up your mind that you're going to see him, there isn't nothing going to stop you. But remember, when you make up your mind, then the devil is going to do everything he can to stop you. He's determined that you're not going to understand it. You're not going to see it. He'll throw every black sheet across he can to keep you from seeing it. What is he trying to stop? He's trying to stop the manifestation of the word in your life. And things that are to be. He says, the gene of your life, spiritual life, was in God the Father before there was even a molecule. And you are nothing but the manifestation of the gene of life that was in God as a son of God. Now you're expressed after his word has come in you to light up this age. You are expressing God's life in you because you are a son or daughter of God. Therefore, you get what I mean. See, you are now made. You're sitting in this church tonight because your duty is to express God to this nation and this people and this neighborhood where you associate. God has come into you to light up this age. Age is steeped in darkness, but there's still a light. The church world's gone into absolute apostasy, but there's still a light. And Lord, help me not to let that light get darkened because of the circumstances I find myself in, because of getting distracted by troubles or getting distracted by pleasures or getting derailed by circumstances or getting overwhelmed. God, help me not to lose sight of my purpose. Amen. Jesus always knew what his purpose was. When he was 12 years old, amen, he told Mary and Joseph, I must be about my father's business. He had a clear vision of why he was on the earth. Amen. And by the message of the hour, we have a clear vision why we're on this earth. And help me, God, not to stay away from all the devices of the devil that's trying to obscure my vision and stop me from manifesting this life. Because this is the testimony. Your life, my life, is the testimony that this message is the truth. Revelation 22, 17. The very end of the Bible, when we get to the very last, last few verses... It says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. That's the day we live in, friends. That's our calling. We are here to bear witness of the light. And just as Herod sent out his, his army to try to kill that manifestation before it could take off, the devil has sent his army after you and I to try to kill the manifestation. Tried to kill it in church problems. Tried to kill it in personal problems. Tried to kill it in family problems. And I tried to distract with prosperity. Tried to blind with shiny things. He tries distraction techniques and trouble techniques and, and, and persecution. He tries all kinds of techniques. But I've got notice for the devil, he can't stop this manifestation. Because this is the promised word of God and it will come into manifestation. I just say, God, help me to yield like I've never yielded before. Help me to surrender like I've never surrendered before. Help me to stand before Pilate and all the pilots of the world and say, for this reason I came into this world, for this cause I was born, that I should bear witness of the truth. And this message is the truth. And I'm not just talking about it, but I want to live it with all that's in me. May the manifested word in me bring life to another word, seed, laying in the womb of a brother or sister. See how important it is that we live this message? Not just talk about it, live it. Proclaim it, speak of it. Speak of it not just with words, but speak of it with a demonstration in our life. Let's not be afraid to pray for the sick. Let's not be afraid to talk to our neighbors. Let's not be afraid to take the position and authority God gave us. Let's not be afraid to step out on a limb and talk to somebody about divine healing and tell them that if you can believe. Brother Branham said, if, if the, the angel said, if you can get them to believe in you, nothing will stand before your prayer, not even cancer. Hey, it might be wrong for me to apply that to myself, but I believe it the same way because I'm standing here as a representative of Jesus Christ, as part of the bride of Jesus Christ. And if you can get them to believe you, amen, maybe that your prayers, amen, will be effective in their life as well. 
Don't be afraid to demonstrate the life. Don't be afraid to live holy, live clean, and talk about living holy and clean. Don't be afraid to pray for the sick. Don't be afraid to intercede for the needs and tell them why you're doing it and what you hope they'll get out of it. And tell them, I hope that when God heals you, you'll recognize that there's a living Jesus Christ that's here to heal you. Amen. And he wants more than to heal you. He wants to fill you with his life. Don't be afraid. We're here to shine the light. Amen. We're not here to be shut up. We're not here to be quiet. We're not here to play nice. We're just here to manifest that life. Paul never wasted an opportunity. In every synagogue he went in, he preached Jesus. Some accepted, some rejected. When they stoned him to death, he got up and knocked the dust off his britches and went to the next city and continued with the same message. Help us, Lord, when we're rejected, when we're made fun of, amen, when we're ridiculed, let's help us, Lord Jesus, just to knock it off, knock the dust off and go right back and manifest the same life and talk about the same thing and love the same way. Ye are the light of the world. Amen. A candle is not put under a bushel basket, but it's set on, city set on a hill. The candle set on a candlestick to give light to all. So let your good works so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father that's in heaven. Amen. I want the word to be born in me. Let's just sing that song. We sang it right before we preached. It was a tiny, simple stable, all beaten and worn, hardly the place for a king to be born. It didn't take something special to reveal his majesty. now why the devil fights you so hard. Troubles on every hand. That's what the apostle Paul said. Persecutions on every hand. Troubles, perils of sea, perils of brother, perils of this, perils of that. We're cast down, but we're not defeated. Amen. Everything was coming against the apostle Paul to stop him, just to stop him. He was such a threat to the kingdom of God just to shut him up, just to shut him down, just to imprison him. They put him in prison, then his letters become our Bible. He's trying to stop that manifestation. The devil tries to bring sickness to get you discouraged, tries to bring troubles to get you discouraged, tries to, and I, I, I say, God, help me to wake up to the tactics of the enemy and say, no, no, devil, you're trying to get me quiet. You're trying to get me discouraged. Instead of walking around joyful and enthusiastic about the word, you're trying to get me to walk down dragging my feet with my head hung low because that helps nobody. Amen. Listen. 
It's the light and life in each of us that's bringing life. If you think about it, we're all here because somebody witnessed to us. We're here so somebody bore the light. Somebody had a difference in them. Somebody had a different life. They spoke different. They talked different. They saw things different. And that did something to you and I. That's why we're here. Amen. Let's do the same thing for somebody else. And not let the devil shut us down and quiet us and discourage us. I want this message to be proclaimed from my life. Not even just from my lips, but when I walk, I want to walk different. The things I look at, the things I enjoy, the look in my eye, the countenance on my face, amen, the way I conduct myself with my family in public, I want it to draw attention to this word that there's a light on this earth. I don't want to live like the world. I want to live like Christ in the world. I want to bring a difference to somebody else's life. The devil's not going to quit today, tomorrow. He's not going to roll over and give up. He'll try another tactic and another avenue. But what's the attempt? He's attempting to stop the manifestation of the word in your life. But oh, I thank God he's a defeated enemy. And I want, if there's thousands of voices, and Brother Ben said what we need now is thousands of voices thundering out. I want to be one of those thousands of voices. If it's the life that hurts the devil, amen, I may have a little life. I may have just a little portion, but I want to add my portion to his problems. I want to be part of the thunder that shakes the devil. May God bless you all. I love you. May, may Christ be born in you with a purpose, with a purpose to manifest the truth with the purpose of being a witness of this life, being a purpose of bearing this life so somebody else can come to life. Oh, what a privilege it is to live in a dark world with a light on the inside. What a place to shine the light. It's darker than it's ever been. Praise God, that gives us more opportunity than we've ever had. I wanna shine that light. May God bless you as you travel. May God bless you with your families. May God bless you with a Merry Christmas. And may Christmas be in you. May the Christmas that this world needs, the birth, amen, be the birth that takes place in your heart and the light that now shines and declares the truth in this dark age. May that be the Christmas present we give to this dark world of letting Christ shine through us. May God bless you all. We love you. Let's bow our heads together and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father. You are so amazing, Lord. Your word is amazing to us. Your plan of redemption is far beyond our understanding how you can take fallen vessels and bring them into your plan of redemption. How you can take scarred individuals, wounded. You can take the nothings of this world, the castaways and cast outs and the rejects and the sinners and the failures. You can take them all and you can use them to shine the brightest light that's ever shined in this dark age. God, your light is so powerful, it's so strong that you can take the darkest of a life and you can transform it by the new birth, by the regeneration of the soul, and you can shine your light through this life. God, we wanna yield ourselves to you, Lord. We wanna give you whatever it is that you desire, which is all of us, we give it all to you. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to the tactics of the devil, trying to stop the spoken word from being the manifested word. But God, you've called each one of us that's here to be that manifested word. That's our position in this day. That is our calling. That is who we are, is we are here to be the manifested word. God, it's you wanting to manifest yourself in the formation of your bride. And we believe by faith we're part of that bride. Help us, God. Give us strength to endure. Give us eye salve, Lord, that we might see. Lord, help us to escape all the wiles and trappings of the devil and help us to move beyond even our broken hearts, even our disappointments, even our discouragements, even our temptations. Lord, help us to rise above that by your strength and help us to shine this light above every tactic of the devil. And may you use our life to bring to life 
a dormant seed that's laying there waiting to spring to life, a prophesied word, prophesied, predestinated to live in this day. May you use us to bring that seed to life. For God, we desire to be used of you. But we know that according to the prophecy in your Bible in the book of Romans, that you will bruise Satan under our feet shortly. It'll be you doing the work, but you need bodies to use. You need vessels on this earth because you will bruise Satan under our feet. God, I want to yield my body to be part of that bruising, Lord, that you can take this vessel and you fill it with your life and help me to be emptied out of everything else that you might in this last day destroy the works of the devil through this vessel. I cannot do it in myself. I have no power. But God, you promised to send the power, Lord. If we would just empty out, if we just die, your prophet said the problem is we're not dead enough. God, help me to be more dead than I've ever been before so I am more of your life living and thundering in this day. God, shine that light through this tabernacle. I yield it to you. Forgive me, Lord, for my compromises. Forgive me for my distractions. Forgive me for my spiritual laziness. I confess it to you, Lord. I'm sorry for it. I don't want it anymore. Help me, God, to break free from those vices and move forward in the power of your spirit. Amen. By the power that you've promised to send, that we might be your witnesses. And may the whole purpose of our life be found in you declaring this message. Oh, we love you. Thank you. This Christmas season, let your word live in us. Lord, we want to call you out of history. Lord, your prophet so nobly called you out of history and brought you to our day. Lord, we want to call you out of history, not to be our historical Jesus Christ, but to be the present tense Savior of our lives, to be our Redeemer, to be our husband, and be the force that moves us forward. We love you, Father. We thank you, God, for this privilege to live in this day. Thank you for this Christmas that's in our hearts. We ask, God, that you would help us as we surrender to you. Take preeminence among us, for that is the part of your plan you're finishing right now. Preeminence in us. We yield it to you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. So let your word be born in the manger of my heart. Let it live in me, let it start. Live inside this house of clay and mold me day by day. Let your word be born in the manger. Not much to behold, hardly the place for his word to unfold. But if I just yield my vessel and let him have his way, from glory unto glory, he'll change me day by day.
live inside this house of clay and mold me day by day. Let your word be born in the manger of my heart and let your word, so let your word be born in the manger of my heart. Let it live.
Praise. 